thank you guys so much. Thank you to the Fathom family for tuning in to the live stream. And for anybody else who's being introduced to us for the first time, what a gift to have this technology. So even while I bet a lot of us are holed up at home, uh, we get to uh, spend this time together, praise together, explore God's word together, uh, worship together. What an enormous blessing. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into today's message. Father God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. I thank you for the knowledge that we have in full, that you are infinite God, infinite in power, infinite in knowledge. Nothing that happens in this world ever catches you by surprise. Nothing that could befall us or frighten us or startle us ever frightens or startles you because you are the infinite one, the great I am, the alpha and the omega, magnificent God. I thank you for the privilege to come here and worship with you today. I thank you for a team and for technology that has the creativity to bring this together. I pray that even though we are scattered, that we are united by your spirit and that this day would be glorifying to you as well as edifying and building and discipling and molding and shaping and transforming of us. That we might grow to be ever more and more into the image of your son, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm so glad uh, to be with you here, here today. I'm about to enter in uh, to God's Word and be discussing a passage that I've never preached on before, but I have heard countless times, and I bet a lot of you have as well. I have a feeling that some of you may have it memorized, probably in King James, because that's how it was taught to most of us, and that is Psalm 23. It is probably among the most beloved scripture in all of pop culture even. People who, don't, people who aren't down with Jesus or with the church know Psalm 23, where David praises his Lord, the great shepherd. The thing about highly um, popular and important texts, though, is that they can easily become rote. They can become cliché. They can become so familiar that we didn't realize why they were so important and precious to us in the first place. Today, while we're sitting at home, and while we're worried about what's happening in the globe, and in our country, and in our community, and in our bodies, perhaps, I want us to take a look at what uh, King David, being guided and led by the Spirit, declared about who God is, his shepherd. What I'm going to start by doing is reading the entire thing. It's just three verses. So Psalm 23, turn in your Bibles. If you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 300. I'm <laughs> <laughs> But it's Psalm 23, and it's six verses, one through six. I'm going to read it all right now, and we're going to go back and we're going to break it down and see what this has to say to us in our lives, in this place, at this time. Let's take a look. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. King David, in this poem, this psalm, which he wrote, employs two very powerful metaphors to describe the relationships, the relationship that he knows he has with God the Lord. And the first is this is that of a sheep being loved by his shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's a very familiar um, verse to, to many folks, but it is packed with detail. The first is this, that David would compare the Lord to a shepherd. There are at least three people, three beings that I know that love, love, love shepherds. The first is this, the sheep. The sheep love their shepherd. The shepherd keeps them safe. The shepherd provides for them, as we're about to see. The shepherd loves his sheep, and they love him. Know his voice. Two other people within God's word that we know love shepherds, because not everybody did. In general, 
shepherds were considered uh, sort of uh, lower class. That's sort of a working man's job, and it's dirty. I don't know if anyone's ever been uh, around sheep within their pens. I had a pastor who spoke to me one time in North Carolina who was employing this metaphor, which the Bible uses, of pastoral ministry. And he says, Nathan, as you shepherd these sheep, you're going to walk amongst them, and when sheep get sick or scared, they bite. Maybe you've had an experience where you were shepherding someone. Any parents out there, you are shepherding your children, right? If you have friends that you've been introducing to Jesus or you've been discipling, you are shepherding and influencing them. For those of us who are married, as a matter of fact, you're shepherding one another as we lead ourselves towards Jesus. And I bet you've experienced that when that person you're shepherding is sick, be it literally or, or emotionally or spiritually, they bite. I'm seeing some, I'm seeing some faces. But I can't tell you. How, it is so much more distracting having just nine people in here. So I'm going to try to zero in on you guys. Bam, they're fired. No, I'm <laughs> I love you guys. But sheep are difficult to care for because they don't know what is right for them. And they will sting the person who is doing what's right for them sometimes. Another thing is they're messy. But the shepherd not only protects them and cares for their needs, but he cares for their physical health. He shears, he shears their wool when it's necessary, when it's time. Loves them, cares for them, would carry them, would lay down his life to protect them. As a matter of fact, the other person who loves shepherds within the Bible is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that for several reasons. Number one, God the Father decided to invite the shepherds at Jesus' birth to be among the first to meet him and welcome him into this world. What a beautiful and awesome privilege that who society might have considered the lowliest or the most, yeah, okay, take care of those sheep. I'll come around on Passover when I need one. God said, no, I want you to meet the spotless lamb who's coming to this world to take away the sins of the world. Amen. Jesus loves shepherds. I also know that he loves shepherds because he makes one of the most beautiful, analogous comparisons to them in one of the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. These powerful statements that are really the key to understanding the Gospel of John. Jesus makes this one of himself in John 10, verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's a reality. We know that in the ancient Near East that a shepherd would sooner die than see harm befall his sheep, which blows my mind. I've had a lot of jobs, and I've wanted those jobs to succeed. One job I had was uh, Staples. My wife Rachel worked there, and my sister Erin worked there. We were all working at Staples. And there's a weird thing that happened. I don't know if it's all Staples, but at this one, it was like they sort of drilled it into your head, like, you are Staples. I worked in business machines, right? So I was trying to sell mostly printers. But they were like, Nathan, don't you love staples? And I was like, I don't know, kind of. Right? And they said, then when someone buys a printer, you need to push the kits. You remember what the kits are? Yep. Cable, ink, paper, service plan for staples. And I was like, I was like, you know, I'm just going to try to help the customer. <laughs> but the degree of devotion that staples expected in, uh, in New Jersey, where we all, where we, where we worked, that's the degree of devotion that a shepherd didn't need to explain to him for his love for his sheep. And Jesus demonstrated it for us to the full. Amen. That while we, his sheep, for those of us who believe, have been wandering astray, lost in our sin, dirty in darkness and broken, he went to such great, le great lengths to redeem us and draw us back to the point and beyond of giving his life to save us. And King David declares, the Lord is my shepherd. At the time, King David didn't know his name. We don't know that until the New Testament. But as we read this, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus and believe, you could just as easily insert Jesus between my and she or between Lord and his. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. He called me, I heard his voice, and I responded in faith. I'm confident that many of you have. And if there is anyone who hasn't, you can and experience the blessing and the protection that we're about to see as we continue through Psalm 23. In that same verse, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And you know what the first thing, the first result of that relationship is that I shall not want. Now that is a little bit difficult to understand in English because I want lots of things. But it doesn't mean that. It's not the Lord is my shepherd and David never wanted anything ever again. David was also, among the many things that I appreciate about him, he was a musician and a poet, because this is a song, right? So when he saw the new lyre, 
down at uh, Liar Center, right? <laughs> <laughs> Liar Center, your century house, the Liar Center. And he, there are things that he wanted. As a matter of fact, there was one thing he wanted uh, on one time that got him in good trouble. We'll probably tackle that passage on another day. But it doesn't mean that you'll never have another desire. What it means is the shepherd loves his sheep so much that he cares about providing their needs. Let's take a look more specifically at what that means. Verse 2. He, the shepherd, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Let's pause there. Again, this is a short passage. Psalm 23 is short. A lot of us memorized it for those of us who came up in the church. And that's a real blessing to have that hidden in our heart. But do we think about what that said? I was discussing this uh, with Erin. She was actually uh, sharing this from her own devotion. And it really moved me. It doesn't say he suggests that you lie down, or he makes your bed and shows you a place that you could lie down. The shepherd, our Lord, Jesus Christ, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I am not happy about the fact that we can't be together in a more intimate way than we are right now, although I am very thankful uh, for this device. But I have been wondering recently during my ser sermon prep if this time isn't part of God's plan to make you and make me lie down. That's Amen. True. That's right. I am so busy most of the time. And I'm not, I'm not bragging. Not always about good stuff, right? <laughs> Sometimes I'm busy about entertaining. <laughs> I'm busy about getting more root beer in my belly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not busy about good things as well as I'm sure that some of you guys are busy about my work. I can be a busy body about talking to people. I can be busy about just filling time and space in my ears and my atmosphere almost constantly with noise, technology, and activity. And you know what oftentimes gets, ed gets edged out? The voice of the shepherd. That's right. Within my own life, maybe you've experienced something similar. But there are times, because the shepherd loves you, for those of us who are his sheep, and he says, no, I'm going to mix metaphors here a little bit because the Bible does too. No, son. No, daughter. I want you to rest. Where does he make us rest? In green pastures. To the sheep, what green pastures represent is good, nutritious, nourishing food. We're at a time right now that because of this COVID-19 scenario that some people are frightened to go out of their house. And with good reason, I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. If that's the way you feel. I want everybody to know, particularly my Fathom brothers and sisters, however you want to respond to this crisis in terms of your safety, I want to help resource you to do that, okay? I, I want everybody uh, to know that in advance. And whatever way I'm able and permitted in order to serve you, as well as the other uh, servants and teammates here at Fathom Church, I want you guys to reach out through the technology, and then we'll do that. However, part of what this um, scenario or response to this pandemic has caused is some people are staying home. and they don't have all the things that they need. In order to live out this spiritual reality, I want to see it take place in a physical reality. That as I and the teammates at Fathom Church are under shepherds, under the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, I want to supply for the family's physical needs. But what David was saying here is above that. It's, it is a spiritual reality that we are nourished by God's word. You guys remember when uh, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? This is Matthew 4. In Matthew 4, Jesus is led into the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil. One of the temptations was, hey man, you know, you're so great. You've been fasting for 40 days. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? But you will see if you can do it. Do a trick for me. And Jesus, quoting from God's word, he says, nah, man doesn't live on bread alone. Or hand sanitizer alone. Or toilet paper alone. <laughs> <laughs> That Jesus, that God's word nourishes us. One of the core values that we have here at Fathom Church is God's absolute truth. We value that and place a high priority on it. However, when I'm busy, when I haven't been made to rest, I don't eat all the time. And here's the thing about spiritual appetites. These are some of the things that I want you to be consuming from God's green pasture. I want you to be consuming his word. I want you to be participating in prayer. I want you to be finding time within your life to worship, not just corporately, which is wonderful. Thanks for coming out and doing this, guys. Then, you know, send a thumbs up or a thank you to the band uh, for, being, for being willing to come out. This is, this is really a really powerful time. And it really helps me do my message, as a matter of fact. 
But the thing about these spiritual appetites, be it for God's word, be it for prayer, be it for worship, is you are never less hungry for it than when you're not doing it. Physical appetites, you get hungry when you haven't eaten in a while. You eat, and then you're satisfied. Spiritual appetites are when I'm not praying, and I'm not worshiping, and I'm not consuming God's word, I don't notice the ache or the pains. And when you take that first bite, I want folks to think about the time that you have now, whether, whether you're at home or if some, of our, some aspects of our lives have been more constricted, that this might be found time to be consuming the nourishment of God's word in his green pastures. And I think you'll discover something. That as you apply yourself to prayer and you find opportunities in your daily life to worship and you start to consume and read his word, your hunger for it will grow. And you know what? He makes you lie down in those green pastures. It says that he leads me beside still waters. Here once again we have part of this analogy with the good shepherd that he provides for his, his sheep, sheep's sheep. Sheep. Sheep, thank you. <laughs> his sheep, oh man, I almost said sheep's so bad. <laughs> he provides for their needs. <laughs> and he's concerned about their safety. Here's the thing. There's a lot of times where the circumstances in this world will be frightening. That's certainly true of sheep. But the shepherd knows. He wants you to be nourished. He wants you to rest. He wants you to be satisfied. For what purpose? Verse 2 leads into verse 3. He leads me beside still waters. What's the effect of that? He restores my soul. Water, in addition to having a, a, a quenching and life-giving effect, also has a cleansing effect effect and its analogy within God's word. When we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, our sins are washed away and our soul is restored. Long before Jesus' name was known or any of his deeds were known, King David knew that the Lord was his shepherd and part of his purpose and his role was to draw us back and restore our soul unto him for those of us who are his sheep. What is the effect of having been restored? What is the effect of having been forgiven? What is the effect of having entered into the shepherd's flock and following him? Well, he leads me in paths of righteousness. There's a thing that frustrates me, again, about passages of scripture that become so rote and so familiar that everyone's aware of them and thinks that it always applies to them. This is only true of those of us who are within his flock. The Lord is the shepherd to those who are his sheep. So someone will claim, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul, and he leads me. But if you're not walking in paths of righteousness, the shepherd is not leading you. He will not lead you in paths of unrighteousness. He won't lead you into danger born of, of, of sinful behavior. He may lead you into danger for his glory, but even then, while it's frightening to the sheep, those are still waters. The safest place that we can be is where God has led us. But I can guarantee that we are not where God has led us if it is not on the paths of righteousness. Why does he do that? Why is, is the Lord Jesus our shepherd? Why does he make us lie down, nourish us with the truth of his word, those green pastures? Why does he restore our soul and cleanse us by those still waters? Why does he lead us in paths of righteousness? He does it for his name's sake. Recently, I was listening to a YouTube video discussion with some very high-profile um, pastors that a lot of you would know who they were on the national stage. They discussed a lot of very interesting things. The thing that has stuck with me to this moment is that they were discussing balance within the church between sharing the gospel and introducing people to Jesus and the ongoing responsibility, which is the outflow of that, to helping people who are in Christ Jesus grow up in their discipleship and in their righteousness. And I would say that every church, every church, and this isn't even a problem, will typically lean towards one of those two things and emphasize it. The danger is, is it at the expense of the other? I can tell you right now that within me, what I emphasize is spiritual growth and discipleship. I need to be reminded and led by the Spirit, by brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be about the business of sharing His gospel. But you know what? Neither of those things, neither discipleship nor evangelism, are ends in themselves. We do it for his namesake. 
And this was the line that came from that meeting. It sticks with me. He says, God's plan within this world is not primarily soteriological. He was just, he was bragging. You know, he knows, he knows big words. What that means is God's primary plan, his primary plan is not salvation for its own sake. God's primary plan within this world is doxological. His primary plan is his own glory. If there's anybody listening, and I hope there is, um, I hope maybe, maybe some fathomers or folks, some tags some folks who don't know Jesus or are not that familiar with him, when you hear that, that this God that we serve, Jesus the Christ, his primary purpose is his own glory, that may stab of, what's that guy's problem? <laughs> Because if any other being in the world that was their primary purpose, they'd be a megalomaniacal me monster. But when you, <laughs> that was a good one, that. <laughs> but when you are the being, infinite in power, infinite in glory, infinite in majesty, infinite in righteousness, you are deserving of all glory. And to do anything less would be counter to your nature. But the thing is, this God. Jesus, the triune God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the whole world exists, you, me, these trees out there, this barn, the technology that is carrying this message so that we can communicate, all of these things he sustains for his glory, for his namesake. And how does a God who is primarily concerned with his own glory operate? He loves us limitlessly as our good and loving shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness, for his name's sake. Here is the key verse for today, in my opinion. This, this, this whole passage is just, is just drenched in beautiful facts. And by the way, it's poetry. Isn't that an amazing thing? What, what, what an awesome God we serve, that in his absolute truth that's found in God's word, he would employ so many methods to teach us. Stories, direct instructions, parables. It, it even, even within uh, um, the book of Proverbs, it calls them riddles. We're part of how it teaches us is that we've got to wrestle with it. And then Psalm. I'm so thankful for that. Then we come to verse 4. I'm going to spend a little bit of additional time here. David says, even though I, this is still in the sheep shepherd analogy. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Death. Is a, is a frightening thing. It's the key feature of what makes this COVID-19 scenario so upsetting. It feels a little bit different to those who know Jesus because we know our ultimate destination is to be with the Father. But you know what? It is appropriate and proper for us to hate it because death doesn't belong here. It wasn't part of God's design. It entered in as a result of sin. So when it happens, we recognize that, that that's an enemy. That's, that's, a, that's a problem. That's not something God desires. But in Christ Jesus, he has defeated it. But for this time, while we wait for his return, it remains and irritates and bothers us. It's a frightening word. There was a, there was a commentator that I, I frequently will check what it is he wrote. His name was Matthew Henry. And his commentary on the entire Bible is completely public domain. And it is very useful for personal devotion. So if you're ever studying God's Word, you're like, I wonder what Matthew Henry says. You can find it anywhere on the, on the internet, the whole thing, Matthew Henry. What he said in this passage is, he said that word is so frightening. But in this passage, it is softened by four of the other words. And the first is this. Shadow. It is the shadow of death. A shadow is not the thing itself. For those who are walking, this COVID-19, this coronavirus, it represents the shadow of death, the possibility that if we might catch it, we might die. If our grandparents might catch it, they might die. If our loved ones might catch it, they might die, which is true, but that's a shadow. But there is no shadow unless there is what? Someone here in person. You can yell it out at home. Light. Right here. Unless there is light. light. Shadows are only cast. Because there is light. Christ Jesus, again, I'm mixing metaphors a little bit, but it's okay when it's God's word. He is the light of the world. The good shepherd is the light. Now, while that shadow is frightening, 
We remember that Christ Jesus, the shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep, he has defeated sin, he's defeated evil, he's defeated and overcome death. If Jesus, and it's, 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 it's up to him, depending on how long he decides to return, before he returns, and in the meantime, our purpose is to share with other people that they can enter into his flock. But for those of us who may or may not taste death, it will not be the end. Because Jesus has defeated it. For those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who are his sheep, it is only a shadow. Another word that softens the fright and the fear of that word death is valley. Valleys can be deep and frightening. This is something that Matthew Henry said, and I found it really, really interesting. They can also be highly fertile places. That while we are walking through this valley, this dark place, with the imminent shadow of death seemingly lurking around every corner, certainly on every news stream, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to grow as we walk closely with the shepherd. Another word that softens it, I'm going to take these two together, Matthew Henry said, we're walk and through. That for those of us who are being led by the shepherd, this is not our final destination. That if we continue to follow him, be guided by him, we will get through this if we follow Christ Jesus, the shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which is not a place I would have chosen to be, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me. Think about the people that you know within your life who don't know Jesus. Maybe they know about him, but they have not entered in to his flock by faith. When they're in the same place that we are, within the valley of the shadow of death, not being guided by the shepherd, how frightening must that be? For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, and it can be unnerving sometimes, and we need to encourage one another, go to God's word, be nourished by those green pastures of his truth, but it can frighten us. Think about those who are without the shepherd. In this, mean, in this, in this interim time, as we're walking through this valley, find them and introduce them to the good shepherd. That they might not fear that evil either. And it's not foolhardy. There's a lot of people who may not know them. I, I saw these stories. I hadn't thought about bringing this up. It's coming on my right now. We'll see where it goes. Where? <laughs> this is a little dangerous. There are a lot of people right now in Florida on spring break. Acting like nothing's going on. My heart breaks for those people. I'm angry. I'm a dad now. I go, why don't you kids go back home? <laughs> Get on in there, you know, things like that. But when I, when I get past that, and that's still there, because we have to have love for one another and, and, and follow these instructions, I actually think that what that reveals is a tremendous amount of fear that's inside. I get that. A desire to act like nothing's wrong. There's a lot of people, even before COVID-19 showed up, they know that they are disconnected from the shepherd, from the living, magnificent God of this universe, and need to re-enter into relationship with him. But they're lost. For those of us who are being guided and following him, it is our awesome privilege and pleasure and responsibility to go and find them and bring them into his fold. So that they don't need to fear the evil any longer. He says in verse 4, I love this, he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I, I, like a lot of us, I learned this passage in New King James. Thy rod and thy staff, they come with me. You know, those are two separate instruments that a shepherd would use. His rod and his staff. Let's start with the rod. It's probably a good thing I don't write these down, but if you guys wanted to play a real funny trick on me, periodically, I'll give a paraphrase. And it's like the Nathan paraphrase. If you were to collect them all together, uh, it sounds pretty goofy, but this is one of those paraphrases. The Nathan paraphrase. What is the rod? It is a club that the shepherd carries. It's his wampum stick. All right? <laughs> thy wampum stick and thy staff, they cover me. <laughs> what it means is this, right? Its role is that when an enemy, be it a wolf or a lion or a bear or a thief, comes, the shepherd is prepared to lather him up real good. <laughs> <laughs> what a comfort! That is different from his staff, however, which is also a wooden apparatus. That's what we think of when we see a shepherd, that he's carrying the shepherd's crook. It's a long stick that they have it either was somewhat naturally curved, or through steam they bent it at the end. And its purpose is to guide and direct lovingly his sheep. Sheep aren't over smart. A sheep will just, bah, just be walking along and just head right towards danger. 
And when the good shepherd notices, he's got this long staff to grab them and hook them, and they bloop, right? <laughs> Any sheep who has ever been redirected by the staff didn't like it. It's not comfortable, but it comforts because it brings us into safety and peace. Is there anyone out there right now? And you, you'd, be, you'd be the one who would have to know this, or perhaps someone could speak this into your life. You were headed towards danger. And you may not know how or why. Well, I certainly know why, because the shepherd loves you. But God did something, and it wasn't comfortable, but it sucked you back into safety. That's his staff. His rod is there to comfort you because it is a weapon against our enemies. His staff is there to comfort us because it redirects and guides our steps. Where? Back towards the paths of righteousness. In verse 5, David switches the metaphor. He doesn't mix the metaphors. He switches it. It's a new scene. Okay? Verse 5, it turns to a dinner party, which is less applicable to us right now because we're not allowed to do this. But <laughs> let's, listen to these, let's listen to these images and allow it to nourish us. David says... You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. If you guys ever get the opportunity to listen to someone who is teaching on ancient Near Eastern hospitality, it's astonishing. They took it really seriously. As a matter of fact, there's parts, there's parts all over the world that take hospitality really seriously. Maybe you do. I know a lot of folks have been over their house and I'm like, dang on. We're not in the custom of anointing one another's head with oil, but a uh, cup overflows. Keep the root beer coming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when he says in the presence of my enemy, it is the custom within the ancient Near East, the, the culture in which this was being written, that by the time a meal had been served, even if the person in the house was an enemy, they were safe under the protection of the, of the, of the head of the household. When we are with Christ Jesus, he prepares that table to nourish us and to care for us and to provide for our needs. And even in the presence of our enemies, be they natural, like a virus, which, which philosophers would call that's a natural evil that came into this world as a result of sin, maybe some other things as well. But that's, that's why any disease is here. That Christ Jesus wants to have communion with you, community with you, relationship with you, table fellowship with you, the closest and most intimate Save for between husbands and wives. You anoint my head with oil. If you came to a person's house in the ancient Near East and they really were interested in and cared about hospitality and took that seriously, <laughs> it's a little odd. It's like going to, at least from our, from our perspective, uh, culturally. But they'd say, come on over here. i got some stuff to put in your mouth. <laughs> got some, I got some palmade. It is about refreshment and it would be fragrant because there is nothing too lavish within Christ's riches that he would withhold from you in terms of his kingdom. Again, don't misunderstand me. What did I say before? I shall not want is not, all right, Jesus, well, I want, I want you to do it real nice. No. <laughs> what it means is that my love nourishes you, adorns you, uh, provides for your needs. You know what it says? My cup overflows. That what he gives to those he loves, he doesn't give sparingly. I hadn't thought about this during sermon prep, but now I wish that I had. This is something that you could do. Do a search within, you, you, you could be, you know, online, or there's some free Bible resources. One of these days, maybe during, you know, lockdown, I'll send some stuff out on this Facebook page to tell you some ways that you could be exploring God's Word in a deeper way. Do a search about how often it describes God's riches and grace as abundant or overflowing. This is a similar explanation. The cup overflows. His love, his mercy, his grace, you're not going to run out. Drink deeply. Even while we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm, I'm jumping back and forth between the metaphors within this passage, he's providing for you and loves you. This winds up being the payout. This winds up being the so what in verse 6. Surely, surely, I'm certain, King David says, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The reason we don't need to fear the evil is that no matter what befalls us, if we are the sheep of the shepherd, we are safe 
for eternity. How do you enter into this flock? We confess our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, and we follow him. Confess our sins, believe in him, and begin a life of discipleship following in the safety of that shepherd. If there's anyone who hasn't done it, I'm going to pray a prayer that if it accurately reflects the disposition of your heart, the posture of your heart, if you agree, pray it as well. It's not a matter of these specific words. It's about what you believe. And if you believe that Jesus is God, you believe he became a man, you believe he died for your sins, you're prepared to confess your sins that he might forgive you because you believe he's the only way. And you want to follow him as your Lord, Savior, and God. It can happen right now. And you can join his flock. And then you too can declare the awesome privileges of following the shepherd, knowing that you are his sheep. Let's pray. God, we love you so much, and I thank you for this day. I thank you for the truth of your word and how it nourishes us. I thank you that you make us lie down in green pastures, which is the truth of your word. That you restore our soul with your cleansing blood, that you wash us in those still waters. God, if there is anyone who has not experienced that assurance, I pray that your Holy Spirit might be calling out to them now and that they might hear by praying this with me. Jesus, I believe you. I believe that you are God. I believe that you became a man. And I believe that you did this so that you could live a perfect life, which no one else has done and which I have not done. Jesus, I have sinned. What that means is that I do things that harm me, harm the people around me, dishonor you. Things like lies and hate and stealing and selfishness, and they, they come natural to me. But I know that it's not meant to be that way, and I confess, and I ask you to forgive me. And I thank you that I know, because your word says that you forgive me, that you have. I pray that you would be my Lord and Savior and God, that I might not only give you my sin as you forgive me, that I might receive your righteousness and the gift of your salvation. And not only does that mean that I will be able to dwell with you forever, but right now, I don't need to fear evil or death or even my own sin because I know that you have overcome. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would have guided and direct me that I might follow you, the shepherd, ever more and more closely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.